So now that you have a basic understanding of what a barrier synchronizer is, let's take a look at a concrete example. The first one we're going to look at is the countdown latch. And we'll see that the countdown latch is a barrier synchronizer that allows one or more threads to wait until a set of operations have been performed by other threads are complete. So you'll see it's used to wait for stuff to finish. So let's talk about this. So this is one of several barrier synchronizers called Countdown Latch. And it's used for fixed size. In other words, we know in advance how many, how many parties or threads there are. One shot entry and or exit barriers. The key thing to remember about Countdown Latch is it's really one shot. Once you're done with its use as an entry or exit barrier, then if you want to reuse it, you have to recreate it, which is a little different from cyclic barrier that we'll talk about later because that just gets reset when everything is, is reached the, to the end. So this, in this case, you have to make a new one entirely if you want to use it again. Countdown Latch does not implement any interface. It just provides a set of API calls, which we're going to talk about in a second. Internally, it applies a variant of the bridge pattern. We've talked about bridge many times before. Remember, we used the bridge pattern when we had the uh, reentrant lock and the semaphore where you, and other stuff like condition object we've talked about where you wanted to be able to change the behavior, the semantics from fair to unfair. So you'd be basically do this. Well, this basically is a lobotomized version that um, extends abstract queued synchronizer, but it really only has one implementation. And it's simply reusing some of the infrastructure under the hood that's provided by the abstract queued synchronizer framework. So the locking in a countdown latch is handled by this implementer hierarchy, much like the stuff we've seen before, where you've got a sync class. And the sync class, which is private, extends abstract queued synchronizer, so it can leverage that as the implementation. And it defines a bunch of methods. There's really three main classes of methods that are interesting here. The first one are the constructors, which are used to initialize stuff. And then the other ones will be the ones that do the actual barrier synchronization logic. So the constructor initializes the countdown latch with a count, as you can see here. You give the count up here. and once the count is set by the constructor, you can never reset it. So you'll see that there's other mechanisms that work slightly differently, but that's the way it works with the countdown latch. So it's very simple. The key methods that countdown latch support allow you to count down, which really means decrement, and await the countdown count to reach zero. So typically, you're going to give it a non-zero count to begin with. And then every time somebody's done, they're going to count down. And other threads that want to wait for the count to drop to zero will call the await method, or one of the await methods. Uh, under the hood, as is often the case with a lot of the, the synchronizers, the method implementation simply forward to the abstract queued synchronizer methods. So as you can see, await gives a acquire shared interruptibly. This await uses try acquire shared nanos, which is just a, a high resolution timer. And then we have countdown, which releases shared by one. So one of the simplest methods is await. It simply causes the calling thread to park itself until the count reaches zero. Now, obviously, if the count is already zero, it won't park at all. It'll just zip right through. But it's often the case where you're doing this for an entry or exit barrier where the count is greater than zero. So a wait simply says, wait for this thing to reach zero. So it's good for use with both uh, exit and entry barriers. This other await does the same thing, except it has a timeout you can give it, which basically says, await, but only up to this amount of time, because I don't want to wait forever. So that's kind of like uh, a tour guide that says, you know, We'll wait for everybody to show up, but if they don't show up for five minutes, then we're going to go on without them. So it's just a bounded wait. OK, and then the last one is countdown. And this simply decrements the count by one. And it, when the count reaches 0, the implementation of countdown will release any other threads, that, which could be one or more, that are waiting for things to happen. 
The thing to remember about countdown is it doesn't block. It doesn't wait. It just decrements and then releases things if there's things that need to be released. In contrast, a wait actually might block if the count is greater than zero. OK, so you can see that a countdown latch is very simple. And I'll show you an example of how to use it in a second, but it's a very simple mechanism and uh, can be used for relatively simple use cases, and it's quite efficient in those cases. So now that you know a bit more about what a countdown latch does in terms of its API, which, by the way, is ridiculously simple, it's like a wait and countdown, that's about it, plus a constructor to give it a count, let's talk about how you could actually program with it in practice. And this will give us a chance to look at a real fun example. And uh, as with all the examples, you can find them in my GitHub account. And uh, this is a really, really fun example. I actually use this for lots of different things in my various example programs. What this allows you to do is it allows you to, it's a framework for benchmarking a bunch of different mechanisms that take different amounts of time to run. So for example, if you look very carefully at this thing, you can see I've got four different ways of computing the greatest common divisor. I have one that uses uh, an iterative Euclid algorithm implementation, one that uses a recursive Euclid algorithm implementation, one that uses a completely crazy binary mechanism for completing, uh, computing the greatest common divisor, which is um, really optimized in some abstract sense, but doesn't actually really perform very well unless perhaps you're writing an assembly code. And then I'm also using the uh, big integer GCD, which for some strange reason is really, really slow. At any rate, the point is that this particular program will run these things, and it's kind of like a contest to see which one finishes first. So think about, uh, you know, like a Pinewood Derby if you were a Boy Scout, or think about uh, some kind of a horse race if you're a horse race fan or something. So all these things are racing, and it's showing which one is completing first. So how do we use the GCD? Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to create worker threads that use countdown latches as entry and exit barriers to make sure that the timing of our little race is efficient and fair, right? We don't want to time things by letting whichever thread starts first start to run and then give it a huge head start because it started first, right? That's not fair. So we're going to use a countdown latch to start a bunch of worker threads, one for every different thing we're testing, and then we'll wait till they're all up and running, and then we'll start them all in one fell swoop. So they all start at the same time. Again, much like the horse race or the, the uh, sprints or something. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to create ourselves an entry barrier that's going to have a countdown latch initialized to one. So that's going to be used to do the initialization. And then we're going to create an exit barrier, and that's going to be the size of the number of tests we want to be running in different threads, one thread for every test. We then go ahead and we iterate through all the things we're testing. And for everything we want to test, we make a new thread. And this thread is going to have an entry barrier and an exit barrier as a parameter to the GCD countdown latch tester, which is just a little helper class that does the testing for us. And we're going to go ahead and make the thread, and we're going to start it. So we're going to end up, in this case, if we have four tests, we'll have four threads. And you'll see that they're all going to wait. So we then come down here. We say starting test, but we don't actually start yet. We're going to wait until the countdown latch countdown method is called. And that will let all the worker threads uh, proceed. So what this does is this particular approach lets all the tester threads start running. But it's actually not necessarily the best way to force them all to wait until we reach a common point. And that's because if one of these threads took a long time to get initialized, the other threads could start to run before that one finishes. And so we'll see later in a second when we talk about cyclic barriers, how that provides a better mechanism for this than countdown latch. So countdown latch can be used for uh, entry barrier, but it's actually not as good as a cyclic barrier. But we'll see that we can, in fact, use it for exit barriers quite nicely. So now everything's up and running. And now the main thread of control 
is going to wait for all the other threads to finish. So it actually works quite nicely for that. So you notice that we had initialized the exit barrier to have the count of four, if there are four tests. And so we're going to call a wait. And what's, of course, going to happen is as these threads finish running their tests, they're going to count down on the exit barrier. And only after the final one is finished will the main thread be able to continue on and print out all tests are done. The thing to remember here is after you call a wait and count down on these things, you can't recycle them without making a new version. Keep that in mind when we talk about cyclic barrier, which behaves a little differently. Here is the class that's going to define a worker thread. You can see countdown GCD, countdown latch tester implements runnable. So it can run in a thread, which is how we started it over here. And we go ahead and initialize the entry and exit barriers in the constructor. And then the run method calls await. So it's going to block until the main thread says countdown. So it's going to block there. Once countdown has been called, we're ready to run. We run the test. And then we call countdown here. And that decrements the exit barrier by one. And of course, as we saw before, the main thread waits for that count to drop to zero. OK, so that's basically how you could use a countdown latch in a form of entry and exit barrier. Although, as you saw, um, well, actually, we'll see in a second the consequences of using this particular approach.